Firstly, thank you for, for joining us. So the whole premise of this session is going to be a workshop. It's going to be hands-on. We've got some labs out there in the cloud that will give us the ability to walk through some of the storage fundamentals and then some storage troubleshooting. Obviously, the name of the, the session is what went wrong with my persistent data. So first of all, introductions. I'm Michael Cade. I'm a technologist at, at Veeam Software, or more focused on the cloud native world. Um, been at Veeam looking after data protection storage for the last eight years. And before that, I was an infrastructure admin focusing on things like NetApp storage, virtualization. So I'm hoping I can bring some of that storage operations into, into the session. And I'm joined with Lee. Yes, hi, my name is Lee. Uh, I'm part of the engineering team. And I'm pretty new to Kubernetes and cloud native in general. Um, I worked with Bosch before in the automotive sector and I have just joined Kasten um, one and a half year ago. So on the same, same beginner in a boat with a lot of folks here, I think. And I think that, that's a trend between everyone that we're speaking to over this week is we have, some, we have some developers, we have some DevOps focused engineers, and we have some operations here. Whereas obviously going back Kubernetes or KubeCon or Cloud NativeCon, it was probably more focused around developers to begin with. And now we're seeing that trend of people having to look after storage, provision storage. So that's why we wanted to, to start that, um, bring that workshop to everyone and get, get people hands on and start looking at it from a 101 perspective. So, I mean, if you're, if you're a storage admin in a Kubernetes world and you're running in production, um, it's probably going to be stuff that you already know, but we want to get people hands on and understanding what volumes are and everything around the, the Kubernetes storage space. The other call out that I want to make is uh, Matt Beta. Um, he's the labs that we've got built. He's he's uh, worked tirelessly on on creating those. So he's a huge, huge asset to, to what we're delivering today as well. OK, so I put this tweet out a couple of a couple of weeks ago. Kubernetes storage is easy, right? How many people think Kubernetes storage is easy? Cool. <laughs> There's probably more sessions that you need to be in. <laughs> but I think when it comes to uh, Kubernetes storage, you can see just surrounding this, like the word cloud, there's lots of different factors and the storage that maybe started with Kubernetes and that evolution, there's a lot of different term, terminologies, um, constructs, objects that come with that, that storage situation. So it becomes a little bit overwhelming uh, and that's what we're hopefully going to break down over the next 90 minutes with some hands-on but also some theory. Now, the big thing that we've done with our presentation is we've made it, there's a lot of information in there. There's a lot of wordy slides. I'm not going to bore everyone. Everyone can read these. It's actually in Shed, so you can, you can go and find that, that presentation now and use it afterwards. The whole point is we want to race through, not race through. We don't want to go that quickly. We want to get you the fundamentals of storage, and then we're going to get into some troubleshooting around that. So to begin with, the session flow of what we want to go through is Let's talk about volumes within Kubernetes, the different types of volumes, what they do, what, what's the use case for them. Then we're going to talk about persistent volume claims. We're going to talk about storage classes, provisioners, volume plugins, and kind of set that stage of uh, these are the fundamentals when it comes to Kubernetes storage. And then we're going to start, get some hands on with those fundamentals. And then we're going to come back and Lee's going to cover some, actually pulling them all together and deploying an application within a Kubernetes cluster. And then the spoiler alert is there might be some issues with that. So we have to go and find out what those issues are. And together we can walk, walk through that. And some of the troubleshooting techniques that both Lee and myself would, would go through from an ops and a developer point of view. And then if we've got time, but again, these slides are in and we've built labs around these. If we've got time, we want to then start looking at storage performance and the protection of storage. Where there's storage, there's generally data. How do we look at protecting that data? So if we get there, great. If we don't, that's fine as well. Everyone will get access to the slides afterwards um, and, and the labs that we've created in Instruct. We've also made available in a GitHub repo that we'll share um, that we've written to be, you can, you can run through it using Minikube or basically any Kubernetes uh, cluster that you have access to. So I think to begin with, like what is state? What is, what is the re requirement around Kubernetes storage? Why do we need state or what is state when it comes to, to Kubernetes or any, any data service within Kubernetes? And like I said, there's a lot of words on here. 
because they, they should be able to stand alone, these slides. But what is state is basically something that's relied on when that, that pod comes up. We want that database, for example, to be consistent whenever the next pod comes up or whatever that life cycle looks like. So we have the concept of stateless applications, and that's generally where Kubernetes began, web servers, web farms spinning up and giving us the availability. A container is, has everything it needs inside, all of the, the constructs of that. It doesn't have a database associated, or maybe that database is associated outside of the Kubernetes cluster. Um, and now we're seeing more of that, that trend around um, people bringing databases. You can see on the, sh on the show floor, the amount of database providers that are, that are out there. You can see that that trend is people are now putting uh, workloads within Kubernetes. So as I mentioned, stateless workloads is kind of where we started because there wasn't the, the APIs, there wasn't the constructs within Kubernetes to allow us to store stateful workloads, or at least not in a very uh, distributed system manner. So what we wanted to do was kind of highlight around, okay, from a stateful point of view, okay, as the life cycle of that pod, the upgrades, the, the updates to that pod uh, being refreshed, how do we make sure that that database is the same database when it comes, or the data is still accessible from that, that perspective? So just a, a short demo, and hopefully this, no, that won't play like that. Hopefully it auto plays. But the whole idea is, is that like, we can create a pod with a Postgres database in a non-persistent fashion, and we can write some data to that database. That's not playing. And obviously, if you think about a database, obviously that's storing our important data. In some most fashions, this is going to be mission critical data within our within our environments. So we can go and create that Postgres database. You can see here that this is a deployment. It's a pod that we're going to spin up. All good stuff. It's going to use a config map for, and I'll get onto those as storage types and volumes shortly. And we're going to create a stateful set that that gives us that ability to to spin up Postgres in Kubernetes. Great stuff all good, except for when we delete that pod or make a change to that pod and it refreshes, and the spoiler alert is that the database or the tables that we've created within that database are, are not gonna be there. So that's why we need that requirement around storing stateful workloads within our, within our cluster. So I've jumped ahead pretty quick here. So we've got our Postgres pod up and running, great stuff. We can then exec into that pod and we can start then interacting with with Postgres, we can create our tables, we can insert data, you can do all that stuff that we do with a, a database in terms of creating data, storing data. So let's create a table, Cube, KubeCon 2023, great stuff. Now we can start adding our data to this. If we exit out of that pod, and then we go and delete that pod though, when, we, when that new pod comes up in that desired state, it's not gonna have access to that data. That data is now gonna be gone it's going to be a brand new Postgres pod, and that table is not going to be there. So in a long-winded way, this is just showing that, yeah, okay, you can, you, can run a state, uh, you can run any application in Kubernetes that requires state, but you have to have that knowledge of how do we store that, that database within our, within our cluster. So uh, the pod has been reprovisioned. A new pod has, has, has uh, come alive. And we're, we're now, there, there's no tables in there. So obviously what you'd expect, you can go back and do this from a, from a Docker point of view. If you haven't assigned a, a volume or a container point of view, if you haven't assigned a, a stateful data, uh, sorry, a, a, a storage unit for that, then obviously that's what's gonna happen. Okay, so different types of volumes within Kubernetes, and we generally will spend more time on the, the persistent volume Type, um, type of volume, but it's important to note that there are other volume types within our, within our Kubernetes cluster. So when we look at ephemeral volumes, ephemeral volumes gives us the ability to still run that stateless workload, and it might be a web scraper that's pulling off images or pulling off some sort of data and storing it just inside of that container, but the life cycle of that container will refresh that. We, again, we won't have that scraped data in there, but that's fine 
depending on the use case around that. It might just be that we're populating images from a, another source, and then we're gonna build out our application that way. So again, if we think about a web server, and maybe images are stored elsewhere, we wanna scrape that, we wanna bring that into our pod, and every time we do that, we wanna make sure that it's, it's available to that. But really, they're still ephemeral. We don't really care whether they um, live or die. We're still gonna have access to our, to, our, um, to our data, but we might have to scrape that again. The next one is around projected volumes. So think about secrets and config maps. So a secret being, I need the keys to get into something, or I need the username password to get into my Postgres database. So we might store that in a, in a, um, in a secret within Kubernetes. Or also config maps gives us the ability to look somewhere else. How do we get to a, another service and have that capability of being able to access that within there? And then the one that we want to spend more time on is around persistent volumes. So if we think about persistent volumes from a storage and operations point of view, let's say that we've got our shared storage, our NAS device, our SAN device, and within there we're going to create LUNs, we're going to create some sort of block or, or, or file-based um, storage, and then persistent volumes is a pool of that storage that we expose to our Kubernetes cluster that now enables us to leverage that within our application. And that could be a different pool of storage for different applications. And I'll get onto storage classes later on as well. And there's different types of persistent volumes in terms of probably more commonly we're seeing now more CSI, but we still have to remember that there are other, other provisioners or persistent volume types that we have within, within and available to us. One that we're gonna be using, and this is never gonna be a best practice, is around the host path, and Lee's gonna to touch on this later as she gets through the, the, uh, the troubleshooting aspect, because the host path is just obviously tied to that particular node within your cluster. So if you're using the, the raw disk from the, the Kubernetes node, then that pod can't be anywhere, at, like the, if the pod is on node two, it can't access the data from node one. So a host path is great for demos and workshops and stuff like that. But when we get into production, you definitely don't want to be using host path. You want to be using one or the other, whether that's built into Kubernetes or whether that's using CSI, which allows us to, and I'll touch on CSI shortly as well. Okay, so the operation side is we're going to look after the storage. We're going to create a persistent volume. This is a pool of storage that's available to us to then use. And then it comes to, over to the developer where we're going to create a volume claim. My application, needs a database of XYZ size, and I, I, I need that to be on a specific storage type, or, or maybe I don't. Maybe as a developer, I don't care. I just want my database up and running for my application, which is generally the, the case, right? So what that gives us is this claim will then go and look for those, those persistent volumes and take a chunk of that, or it'll find uh, a persistent volume that suits the needs, the desired state of that, that persistent volume claim. And then again, quickly moving through the storage classes is think of this as the, 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 uh, the type of storage that you're exposing, whether it's, I'm using gold, silver, bronze here, so that could be fast, medium, slow storage for different workloads, and your persistent volume claim can, can tie into one of those. That a developer might always say gold, or they might say silver, and, uh, but it could be, this is where we start talking about things like storage policy-based management, about how we can define what each of those storage classes give you in terms of functionality. And then provisioners, kind of tying in with the, the persistent volumes is how do we, so the history lesson here is before we had CSI, and again, I'll touch on that shortly, is we had entry provisioners, where there was something called flex volumes as well in, in between. But ultimately, this gives us the ability to leverage a provisioner to give us that, that persistent volume or that storage that we have underpinning the, the cluster. So Intree was there. And the, the, the downside to Intree was that although Kubernetes is released on a three releases a year, it meant that the storage vendors had to, get, pull the, had to put in the PRs for their storage and their supportability within that Kubernetes release. So every time Kubernetes was released, you'd have your new bit of code. But obviously that, that make, Kubernetes is a, not just about storage. There's obviously other PRs going into it to make changes. There's a lot of QC, QA going on onto that. So it made it slow for any storage vendor to be able to give the functionality that they required within that 
within the entry um, entry provisioner. So then along came CSI. CSI is quite mature now over the last couple of years. And um, what this gives us is basically a consistent API across our Kubernetes cluster for our storage vendors out of band to be able to create their, their API calls to this CSI API um, set of instructions and we tie into that so that we're not now as, an ent as a storage provider, we're not reliant on, um, we're not reliant on the Kubernetes release cycle. So we, as a storage vendor, you can release out of band from that Kubernetes release and take advantage of the CSI API to provide that. And that, that gives us a much easier way of being able to leverage storage um, instead of using entry, entry provisioners. But because we started with Intri, it's, it's also anyone that's just started in that Kubernetes storage space, you're probably still going to see some Intri, Intri provisions out there. Namely in the public cloud as well, they still have options to use both Intri provisioner um, storage types and provisioners, as well as their own now CSI um, based driver that interacts with, with that. And if, if we get to that lab three, or if anyone races ahead, you'll see that that CSI um, API is, is ever evolving in terms around volume snapshots and other functionality about resizing um, persistent volumes, et cetera, on the fly as part of that cluster. The other thing that I used in that first demonstration was around staple sets. So staple sets gives us the ability to provide a bit more of a, a pet naming convention to our, to our, um, our pods that we have. So, You'll see that Postgres was Postgres hyphen zero, and if we were to spin that up or, or uh, sorry, uh, scale that up, we would have Postgres hyphen one, two, three, and what happens after that is if we're making a change, we're updating our, um, our pods or our staple set, it would do it in a uniform way of being able to say, okay, we're gonna get rid of three first, then two, then one, whereas from a deployment perspective, you're gonna have a long, naming convention and really we don't care we're just gonna let's terminate all the pods at any given time there's no really no real order to that um, so which is why the ab the the best practice is to use a staple set when you're using when you're using data services and there's a table here that goes through some of them commonalities the or, or the differences between a staple set and a deployment now I've seen people using deployments to look after their their state for workloads it's possible, it just means that those pods, it means that it's quite erratic when, it's, when we start doing anything to those, those pods in terms of updates, in terms of uh, what we're doing there. Okay, so check on time. Perfect time, actually. Perfect time. So what we wanna do first is get you onto the lab, into the instruct, so we're actually a big shout out here as well is that we didn't really want however many people are in this room to be downloading container images because that would only end up in a, in a bad way. So we're leveraging Instruct as a, a service for those isolated sandbox environments um, and we're just building out that, that, um, the steps in which to walk through some of the things that I've, that I've just mentioned. So what we're gonna cover in this first lab is generally around those different volume types, different storage classes, and then we'll get, go into lab two, which is focused around um, uh, troubleshooting that. So if you wanna, the, the code on the left-hand side, is, uh, the QR code on the left-hand side is what's gonna take you to that, that, um, to that platform. And then if you wanna wa walk through the lab instructions on the right-hand side, and we'll walk through it as well. But I just wanna give you time to go and take that in, get hands-on, and start building out some of those scenarios. Now, I know it's being recorded as well, but also this, the one on the right-hand side is a GitHub repo where we've also, where you don't have to use Instruct. You can use Minikube on your local machine or any really any Kubernetes cluster that has some storage associated to it. So anyone can walk through that in your own, in your own pace as well. So with that, if everyone wants to dial in. If anyone gets um, any issues with that, if you raise your hand, we'll, we'll come out and, and try and help you get onto, onto the platform. But we're gonna just leave you for a few minutes to see how that, how that pans out, and then, uh, and then we'll get back into the troubleshooting. Yeah.
Um, a bit of a housekeeping as well. There's a bunch of seats in the front here on the left with charger. Um, uh, so if you sit in the back with no table, feel free to move around so you can have space for your laptop as well. So hopefully everyone's at this similar point if you're walking along um, and you'll have a list down the your right hand side of the screen where there's a few scenarios that we're going to walk through based on some of the the volumes the and the storage classes that we that we just covered in the in the slides yeah if anyone has any issues just raise your hand and we'll we'll try and help Well, folks who just got in their seats in the front as well with the table and power bank. Also, if there's any, any questions like about what we just covered while you're walking through the lab, then if you put, uh, there's, I think there's two mics mm -hmm. down the runway, down the tracks, if you want to go up to them and ask any, any questions. Um, when I was talking about, I was talking about um, projected volumes as well, and I specifically mentioned config maps and secrets. You'll see in the in the in the text that we also talk about two others. One is downward API, which is used to provide uh, cluster environmental details. So um, anything about like pods or the container, such as things like names or um, Things like annotations, it allows us to leverage leverage that as well as part of that, um, as well as service account tokens as well. So we've added a little bit more detail in there that you probably didn't see on the on the slides as well. I think we wanted to keep it quite high level instead of going into the detail around all different volume types.
bloody as well. Yeah, yeah. So, so just hopefully everyone's following along. But basically, what um, what I'm doing here is I'm following through the steps. I've just created that ephemeral ephemeral volume, which had a, a had a, a a scraper by all accounts, and that that allowed us to bring it into our into our container. And then I moved on to the projected volume, where I created a secret and a config map. And now we're um, creating a volume that will consume that secret and that config map. As that might be a connection to an external database. It might be a secret to access that database. The config map is going to give you the, the maybe a URL out to a, an Amazon RDS type database that is not obviously stored within the Kubernetes environment, but it makes it aware of of uh, the application. It makes the uh, it allows us to leverage that from the application within within Kubernetes. And what, what we're running in this command is actually just going to talk. So we're executing into that, that pod that we've just deployed. And then we're, we want to understand what that secret is and how we can consume that with inside that pod. So start thinking about how that secret is pulled from Kubernetes into the pod and then used to authenticate maybe into our database. Um, and then we're uh, also doing that from a config map, knowing where we're going to connect to from that. So you can see here that true super secret lab, the sky equals blue, just different um, data points that we might need to use to to access other other resources. Obviously, we're not connecting to an external database in, in AWS. But it's a scenario that, that it could be. And then the third volume type being that persistent volume. So we're going to go and create that persistent volume manually using this YAML. It's called my volume. It's going to have a capacity of 10 gig. And this is actually using the host path. Like remember what I said about in a lab environment, this is all good. But if we're going to try and share storage across multiple nodes, of Kubernetes nodes, then we want to consider one of the other persistent volume types. Otherwise, you're going to be in for a, a shock if your pod spins up in a different node and you won't have access to that, that underpinning uh, persistent volume. So that persistent volume is that, that pool of storage that is available to us from the host path here. But really, that could be any, any storage type. If we go and describe that, you see all the details of where it is, what it allows us to do. So in terms of access modes, read, write, read, write once, read, write uh, many. It's a file system. It has a capacity of 10 gig, and it's using that, that host path type um, there as well and access to the, the mount point that you see there. So then we're going to create a persistent volume claim. So the application now, you can see here that it wants in fact, let me copy it first. I'm going to walk through what a persistent volume claim is asking for. So we're going to call it my PVC. We're going to you deploy that. Uh, so another thing I didn't mention was that a persistent volume is cluster a cluster-wide resource, but a PVC is specific to a namespace. Now, this particular PVC is going to be the size of four gig. It's going to be using that persistent volume that we that we created called my volume, but obviously that leaves six gig free in that pool of storage. Now, if if we had lab two and we wanted to consume, we wanted to create um, another application that leveraged that same persistent volume for whatever reason that may be. We could obviously go and consume that with two, four, five gig of uh, data. Obviously, if that goes over that 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 persistent volume won't 
uh, it won't satisfy the desired state of the persistent volume claim, so it'll be stuck in a in a in a position where it can't bind that data or that persistent volume claim to a PV. Is there a way? So if we now go and look at the PVC within lab one, you see that it's bound. In fact, there's a two commands that I just ran. So the first one being the my volume, you can see that it's bound. You can see what it's taken up or what it's been used by here with the claim. Didn't need to copy that. Um, and then just type in QTC. PV, notice that it's not anything to do with a namespace, so we're not, it's not assigned to a particular namespace as a persistent volume, but you can see here as well that it's, it's also bound. So both of them are married up now, so we have access and the ability to then use that within a pod to consume that storage. So then next up, we're gonna create that pod. that long and we probably don't need to watch it but we can jump into that pod now and we want to get the output of no no we're going to copy that file into our persistent volume claim a simple file operation and if we on our on our node we're then going to go and see what we have actually copied you can see that we've uh, We've got that detail that we've that we've copied to that that file within the persistent volume claim. Let's delete that pod. Let's clear that again. One thing, one thing to, oh, so one thing to make note is the um, the host path that we have on the PV it, at foo and the mount path that we have on the on the pod is at bar. Even though the data in the data is the same. Um, the mount path on the pod, uh, sorry, the mount path, yeah, mount path on the pod is, is the directory from within the perspective of the pod. So it's going to be a different directory than what you have on the host system. Um, we purpose, purposely uh, distinguish those out to uh, give the understanding that it, it, those are the same data, but two different directory depending on where you're coming from, the pod perspective or you accessing the data from your, um, from your host. Yeah, exactly that. So then we're going to delete that first busy box pod that we created and we're going to create a new new pod that will have access to that same persistent volume claim. And the spoiler alert is is that that detail should still be in that that new pod that we've just created. So if we exec into that again I'll go and clear Have that password that we put there and then it goes on to the storage classes so the storage class remember being that different type of and you can but I, I use gold silver bronze because that's an easier way of describing fast medium slow or something along them lines but this could be something that around capability it could be around I only want my databases on this particular storage um, uh, class. I only want my messaging queue on a different storage class. I don't want it consuming like my most expensive storage, for example. So if we look at the storage classes that we have available to us, we have we have two. We have the local path, which is what we've used so far, and we also have a CSI host path, which again is still host path, but it leverages some of the functionality that you get with the the CSI functionality that I mentioned. I'm pretty sure that that wall of text tells you that. <laughs> so what we're going to do is we're going to go and create another persistent volume claim. 
And with this, it's going, we're defining what that storage class name is here. And we'll, we'll touch on dynamic provisioning as well in a bit. Again, if we go and clear this. I'll, I'll leave that one to you, Lee, because that one's, <laughs> you're going to use that. Um, and then let's, let's send a pod into there to consume that PVC. Again, defining what that storage class is as part of that. So you can see that there's lots of different options about how we consume the, the storage, the underpinning storage. Um, So what Michael is doing here is called dynamic provisioning. In the yes. previous step, we created the PV and then we bind the PV to the PVC and then use the PVC to mount with the pod. But what he's doing here is dynamically requesting the volume um, through a PVC request that is going to talk to the storage class. And storage class going to have a driver that's going to create the, uh, the volume for you. Um, so we don't have to worry about creating volume ourselves. Yeah, so, so now, if you remember, we created a persistent volume manually using that, that YAML file, and now we've dynamically created this next one that has this, you can't really see that name, but hopefully if you're, you're running through that, you'll see that we've dynamically created a, a different named PV, uh, PV called PVC hyphen um, that, and that's, that's the dynamic approach to deploy or leveraging storage. Hmm. And something we didn't touch, uh, but we can talk about it now, is the story class have a lot of different specs on how you would like your pro uh, volume to be provisioned. And the one thing we did differently in the story class is we having the um, binding mode to be wait for cus bus customer versus immediate. And uh, in the previous step, if we had take a look at the PVC, uh, oh, sorry, taking a look at the PVC, we've seen that it's pending instead of bound before our pod was up because the customer, which is the pod, who's supposed to consume the, the volume wasn't up yet. Um, so with the storage class, you can specify more than uh, more than just what drivers you use. You can also uh, do what kind of finalizer you want. You can do, sorry, you can do, um, you can specify what kind of volume mode you want. Um, and, um, and then the, but the request is going to be fulfilled dynamically as you create a PVC. Yeah, and that, that could be, let, let's say you're in a cloud, a managed cloud or managed Kubernetes service that only maybe has one storage class available. So actually, yeah, you've got free gain to go and deploy your persistent volume claims in that time. So it just dynamically creates them against that. So has everyone walked through that lab now? A couple of thumbs up. So hopefully, if everything's done correctly, you'll hit next. We'll get a big green thumbs up saying, well done. And then I'll hand that over to Lee to talk about the troubleshooting side. And we can get into hopefully playing some games. Yes. <laughs> so this is where the fun starts. So in the previous section, um, Michael have walked us through some of the fundamentals. We have walked through all the labs. And they just worked. Um, all the configuration was correct. You don't really, you sh shouldn't really having any problems um, spinning everything up. And now in the next step, we're going to take all of that and create a full-on application. Um, so I will go ahead and the application that we are going to deploy today is going to be Pac-Man. Um, and if everything works, we should be seeing this um, on either in your Instruct Lab or um, when, you, uh, do coop, uh, when you do pull forward, which I'm gonna walk through in a little bit. So before we're diving into um, getting hands-on, I want to give everyone a little bit of a application topology to understand what is it that we're working with. So this is the high-level topology of the application. We have the um, front-end Pac-Man uh, app uh, that is written in, it, that's written in Node.js that's going to talk to a back-end database um, and 
the backend database is we're going to be in MongoDB, so there's going to be some scripts that is going to be injected in, in, the, in the format of config map that stores some of the startup script for the pod. Um, there's also some data, obviously. Uh, so there's going to be some PVC and PV, and um, the database is going to be, sorry, this is a little bit outdated, but the database is going to be a stateful set, and the app itself of Hackman is going to be a deployment. And there's going to be, need to be communication between the two, so there's going to be a database service um, that is cluster IP, because just within the cluster we need to talk to each other, and then we're going to have to access the app from outside, so Pac-Man is going to have a service of node, of node port. And so, our task is to deploy the application. Um, the premise is all of the resource manifests uh, of the topology I've just described should be available in Lab 2. Um, if you are using the GitHub repo, it's in the Lab 2 folder. If you are using Instruct, it's going to be in the Instruct Lab automatically for you. And uh, this is a bit of a mapping on um, the YAML files you're going to have um, with the topology. Um, and there should also be the same table in the Instruct Lab and also in Minikube. And so um, our task is pretty simple. Deploy them, then access the game. Um, if you are using Instruct, the game is going to be available in the tab in Instruct already. You don't have to do anything. Matt have taken care of that for us. If you're using Minikube, then you do have to do a little bit of, uh, of port forwarding. So these are the commands you're going to use, and then the, the game is going to be available in your, in your browser. Um, and I think we have alluded to this already, but these manifests are not going to work out of the box for us. This is why we're here. We're going to troubleshoot. And um, the troubleshooting part is going to be on your own. Um, we're going to walk through it, but probably not going to be immediately. So the premise is that we're going to give you guys maybe 15 minutes to play around. Um, we're going to be, if you have problem particularly, you can raise your hand. We can walk to you. But it, it's a learning space when I want to have the chance to play with it, figure it out. There's going to be more than one solution, so we're going to discuss this. Um, after 15 minutes, I'll walk through what are the problems, what are the solutions. We go back and forth on what are, you know, what is the implication of the, of the solutions. Um, so without further, oh, one more thing is this is a, uh, it's a, we've taken it with the premise that this is going to be a one-on-one -on -one lab. So, uh, as we're going through, I'm probably going to talk a little bit more about the commands that we're going to use for debugging as well. Um, if you just, you know, look at the application that doesn't work and you're like, oh my God, what did I do? Um, we're going to talk from that perspective as well and not just give you the solution. So you can see this is available for you as a short uh, table, uh, but as also the cheat sheet from, um, from Kubernetes um, documentation. It's available as well um, in, um, in the repo, and I think in, in, yeah, in Instruct as well. Okay, so um, now choose your platform of choice, and uh, I think we'll give it 15, 20 minutes from now, and we'll, I'll, I'll assess and we'll see where everyone is in the room. If you finish early, Congratulations, you can play the game or move on to the next lap if you want to. Um, and again, if you have any questions, anything, raise your hand, we'll come to you. Um, okay, let the fun begin. Does anyone have any problem getting into the lab? Awesome.
I'm just going to put this table back up so that everyone has that as a reference point if you So in the Instruct Lab, there should be a text editor. Um, you can save the file by hitting the floppy disk. Um, yeah, <laughs> can't believe it. Can, <laughs> yeah, control S won't work. And well, I can't believe this is saying floppy disk. Laptop, but, yeah. um, and if you have a lot of tabs open on the text editor, maybe you won't see your file. So just close yes. off some file. You're going to be able to see um, the symbol.
How's everyone doing? Any questions at all? Deep in thoughts. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> Anyone playing Pac-Man? Going, Julia. Have you fixed it? Are you playing playing Pac Man? Cool. Okay, by a show of hand who have completely solved the problem. Awesome. Also by show of hand who like five more minutes to work on this before I <laughs> okay. Okay, we'll give it five more minutes of silence before I jumped in. <laughs> Is it ready on yours to go? Yeah. Cool. Should have definitely thought of a prize for the highest score on Pac-Man, shouldn't we? <laughs> we should.
-hmm. Yeah. Okay, so I think I'm gonna go ahead and start diving in. Um, and uh, feel free to keep walking on, uh, working on it still if you are really, really close. Um, if not, feel free to uh, follow along. I I'm, I'm again mentioned that this is a one-on-one -on -one lab, so I'm gonna take a little bit of time to talk through the commands that I'm using as well. Um, so we already know that it's not working. And generally, so I'm, I'm, talk, I'm going to talk about the perspective of what I would usually do when I run into a cluster and something is not running, what kind of debug command I, command I would use. And generally, I would like to see the status of my cluster and see what, what's my pod, where's my, um, how is it doing, what's going on. So I usually do that by um, watch, kubectl, get all, and then give the namespace that I'm working in, which is lab two. Um, the watch command, get, refresh the command every two seconds so I can keep the status live as I'm working through. And the get all does not really get you all. It gives you um, deployment, replica set, give you services, give you pods, but it doesn't, give, it doesn't give you PVC or PV or any other resources. So there's something to be mindful as well. But for the high level, I'm gonna start with this. And I see that, uh oh, my pods are not up and running. I see that the Pac-Man MongoDB is pending and the Pac-Man Pac-Man is crash loop back up. So I'm gonna go and go ahead and check out the pod Pac-Man MongoDB um, and see what is going on with the, the pod. And the command I'm gonna be using for that would be kubectl describe. So the describe um, command give you a human readable um, status, it gives you all the specs of the pod as well as the events that are happening to the pod. So it's really useful to have all of the information in the human readable, um, human readable format. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that. I'm gonna have to say what resources I am describing. And the namespace. Okay, so I see that I, the pod have failed scheduling. And the reason is because one pod has unbound immediate persistent volume claim. Okay, then the next step, I'm gonna go follow this path and check what is happening with my, with my P, uh, PVC. And again, the get all doesn't really give you the information, so I'm gonna go ahead and check manually here. And PVC are namespace resource, so when we do a get PVC, we do have to provide a namespace. Okay, I see that my PVC, static PVC is pending. So I'm gonna go ahead and go down the path and check what is happening with my PVC. And I see a volume mismatch. So PVC cannot, the controller is telling me cannot bind the requested volume because the requested PV is too small and the volume being pinpointed here is static PV. So I'm gonna go ahead and, and check again what is the spec for my, for my PV. Another way of getting specs um, that is on, that is going to, that's running, oh, sorry, another way of getting the spec is using the uh, command get. So I'm gonna go ahead and get my PV here, static PV. Um, and PV is non-namespace resource, so I don't have to provide a namespace. And um, I can specify the format that I want to get the specs on. So I can go ahead and say, oh, YAML. Then I see my spec here. This is my persistent volume. And I have the storage capacity of one gig. And my, so I'm going to go ahead and double check my PVC and see what was the capacity that was being requested. and it is two. So here we have a mismatch in volume capacity, so I'm gonna to have to reprovision my, uh, my volume to match my PVC. And um, the spec of PV and PVC are immutable, so we can't do an edit. What I have to do is gonna to have to delete the PV and then change the spec and then recreate the PV. Um, I can do that in my, oh, let me go ahead and delete it first. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and chain my spec here.
make that two. Save it. And then apply. PV, no need for this. Okay, my PV is created. I'm going to go ahead and check. Let's see. Okay, so I have my static PV, the capacity is two gig, um, but it's still available. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and go back here and check my pod is still not up and running um, and my static PV here is still not bound. So I'm gonna go ahead and check the PVC again and see what is it doing. Oh, by short of hand, did everyone got through that first problem? Awesome, all right. Oops. Um, no, I want to know what event happened to my PVC, so I'm going to view describe instead of getting the spec. Okay, so we see a new event from the controller. Cannot bind the requested volume because the story class name does not match. All right, so let me check here. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and double check the spec between the two again. My static PV. So I see here that the access node. Hmm, you can't really see here. I'm trying to find the best way to show you guys the story class that the select PV is using. I'm not sure if this is very clear, but the story class for the static PV is actually empty. And this is because we have uh, manually provisioned the volume. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and check the PVC. Okay, and I see that the story class name here is CSI host path SC. And so there is a mismatch. Now, one thing I wanna point out is that we double check again at the local YAML file that we use for the static PVC. We actually do not have a story class defined here. And that is, um, and this is done on, then this is to point out that if you leave out the story class name for PVC, the default is going to be used. Um, the, uh, it's going to be injected as you create a request for the PVC that the default uh, story class is going to be used. And so if you, um, so if we go to check here, um, what story class we have in the cluster, we see that the CSI host path SC has a default annotation into it. Um, and this is an annotation for the story class itself. I guess SC. You can see there's an annotation story class Kubernetes IO is default class true. And this is to, um, to, to tell that 
this is a default storage class, which is going to be used if there's a store, an empty storage class name. This is to point out that be mindful about all of some of defaults and some of the um, automatic injection that Kubernetes do for you on your behalf. Um, in this case, you have to be mindful about what is the default storage class um, of, of your cluster. So to remedy from this, we're going to go ahead and specify a storage class for our PVC and make it empty because we are doing a manual provision. And again, the specs for the PVCs are immutable. So we have to delete the PVC and then recreate the PVC. And also by short of hand, um, have anyone gone through this step? Awesome. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and delete that and then make sure I have a stored class name in here. You can have a type people watching you. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and double check my PVC. It's bound. Yes, um, this is what you wanna see when you um, work with PVC and people you wanna see it bound. And I'm gonna go ahead and double check the status of the parts. And I still see that MongoDB is running to error and it just restarted a second ago and it's crashing loop back off. So I'm gonna go ahead and check again, what is, the, um, what is going on with my pod? Again, I'm gonna use describe. Okay, well, all I'm seeing here is that for some reason, um, the pod is failed to restart. And it's from here, I'm not seeing any more information of what can be wrong with my pod. So I'm gonna go ahead and switch uh, to a different command for debugging. And that's gonna be, I'm gonna be using the log. I'm gonna log my pod and see, hopefully there's some kind of debug log that gonna give information about what's going on with the pod. Okay, I see here that I have a permission deny issue by uh, for creating the directory bitnami mongodb data. By short of hand, who have gotten to this point? Okay, by short of hand, who have gotten over this point? Awesome. Cool. So actually, I want this to be a bit of an interactive um, session at this point because I think there's multiple way of solving this. So for folks who have gone over this, would you mind sharing what you've done so far and how you get over the permission deny issue? If you would like to, if not, that's fine too. Just the, yeah, the mic. Can we turn on the mic? Walker mic. Yep. Yeah, okay, thank you. Um, the easy fix for me was uh, to um, check where the uh, local data is stored. Uh, that was in the slash data pod. Um, and to easily check what permissions or what user it's running, I just did uh, chmod777, restarted the pod, and then uh, changed the ownership uh, from there. And then the pod was running. Mm -hmm. And I plugged Batman, so. Awesome, thank you. Did anyone have a different solution than that? Oh, did everyone hear the solution? Yeah, so one over there, Lee. Okay. Hi. 
I uh, changed the storage class name to the default storage class. Ah, yeah. That okay, does anyone different. have yeah. a different it's solution the than that? Got the problem. So let me repeat, the um, two solutions so far that we um, have had in the crowd is, one is a manual way, he went into the local directory, he changed the permission of the, uh, of the data path to 777, which is free for all, anyone can access it, and then the pod is able to access it. And uh, the gentleman in the back have a different solution, which is he changed the story class name to default, and he go the dynamic provision route. Um, and there's also, I think we've had two more solutions if we try. So Michael, what did, we, what did you do? Yeah, so I went into the, the, the pod spec and just changed it to run as user, um, whatever, whatever it, it, yeah, I think it could be any number at that point, which is kind of, yeah, kind of hacking the ability to get to that. Probably not the best practice when you, it opens up the door to anyone being able to access that file at that point, so. Yeah, so the third <laughs> solution is that he sued all it. He escalated the pod to have privilege of the root, and then you can just go, <laughs> and you can Don't just go that. in. And also, uh, so let me let me show you again. The PV have the, um, the information on where in the host the data path is. So what I need to check is the static PV folder in the data path. So we see static PV here, so I'm gonna check the permission. So when I first saw this, I'm like, okay, what did this mean? Some folks here might remember this by heart, I don't. Okay, so from here, this means everyone can read the directory, but its content can only be changed by the user. And we can see here the user um, is root and owned by group root, uh, it is root and also uh, owned by the group root. So his way would have worked because you changed the group user and the user of the pod itself, but might not be the best solution because now you are allowing a pod escalated privilege into your underlying storage system. Um, changing the, the, changing <laughs> the permission of the pod to 777, oh sorry, not the, the pod, the PV to 777, is slightly better because you are de-escalating the privilege of the of the PV itself, and the pod is not escalated in privilege at all. But it, but if you have critical mission uh, data in in the PV, you might not want to make that free for all. So what I did is I actually changed the owner of the PV to the user that matched the um, UID of the pod. So how do I find that? I can see that in the, um, the YAML file for my stateful set. If we check out the security contacts here, we see that the user for um, our pod is 101 and also the group is one, uh, well, sorry, 1001. So I'm gonna go ahead and change the permission of the volume to just match that. Or oh, actually I'm gonna, I'm gonna make the, I'm gonna change the owner of the volume to match my pod. Okay, let's check again. All right, don't ask me who they are, but they're different than root now. Uh, so I'm gonna go ahead and double check my pod status. So one thing about crash loop back off is Kubernetes have an exponentially in incremental wait time. As you, um, as you wait for restart, it starts with, I think, two seconds, and then in five seconds, then it exponentially increase until it reaches 15 seconds. So sometime, even if you have done something, the pod is in the middle of waiting for restart, and it's going to take time. So what I can do as well, I can manually restart it, and then I'm gonna restart my Pacman MongoDB, so I'm gonna do a um, rollout restart for my uh, stateful set.
Okay, I don't know that either. Namespace. Eh. Thank you. Did I mention you can never type when people are watching you? Okay, we'll give up a second. Um, and then we'll also explore the solution of dynamic provision as well, um, once this is up and running, and then see, um, I'm actually curious if anyone's seen the, um, the permission uh, of the volume when it's dynamic provision by, by the driver. Um, we can also explore that as well. But I can go ahead and create the, um, the PVC already. Come on. Yeah. I'm going to restart the other one too. Oh, okay. Okay, MongoDB is is is. <laughs> yes, it's on. Yeah, it's running. Yeah. Okay, so MongoDB is running. We'll double check by checking the lock as well. Oh yeah, remove pods. Oh yeah, pods. It's held log. So it's all good. Man. Okay. And then Pac-Man, Pac-Man is also running. So. You know what that means. We live. Now, I do want to explore the option of using um, dynamic provisioning. So I'm going to go ahead and um, delete the PVC. Ah. But I can't delete the PVC. Yeah. It's, it's as if you planned that. <laughs> <laughs> Does anyone know why I can't delete the PVC in this case? It's bound and finalizer, correct. So let me double check the spec for my PVC here.
it's going to be stuck in terminating for a while, and that is because of the, uh, this finalizer, Kubernetes IO PVC, PV, PVC protection. And what this finalizer does is that you are not allowed to delete the PVC um, until all the user of the PVC have also terminate themselves. So in this case, we have a running pod that is actively using the PVC. Um, so it might not be a good idea to go ahead and delete your underlying data. So this is a way of protecting um, uh, your, your data as it's running. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and create a different PVC. Okay, in this case, I'm not going to have the volume name. I'm going to leave the storage class name empty. So the default one is going to be used. I'm going to change my name, the TVC name to dynamic. Wait, what happened? Where's my... That's, no, that's the static ah, one. Ah, crap. So yeah, you're good. Here we go. Okay, good to go. Okay, PVC created. Again, I'm gonna double check just to make sure that it's bound to something. Okay, I see that my PVC is bound. Now the next step for me is to change my um, stateful set to actually using this PV and PVC instead of using the static one. And for this, I can, again, do a local edit and then apply, or I can actually do live edit um, using kubectl uh, edit. And then um, what it does is gonna pull in the YAML file to your, um, editor of choice, and then you can uh, edit and then save, and then it's gonna, the request gonna be pushed back up, and then it's gonna, the configuration can be applied. So I'm gonna go ahead and do this here, so I think it's a little bit easier to see. Stateful set. And here, instead of using the static claim, I'm gonna be using the dynamic claim. I'm checking that my claim name is correct, okay. Okay, now we watch. Okay. So if we are to take a look at the dynamically created PV for us, which is this claim, and this is the PV that I'm interested in. We see that um, the path, where did it go?
recorded my passport. Is that like Ellen White's kind of? Is it part of my kind of place of belonging? Mm -hmm. I think this is Hof Patna. Sorry, uh, what I'm trying to do here, and we're running out of time, so what I'm trying to do here is to find you the path of um, on the host where the volume is created and um, show you the uh, permission that comes with the volume that's being created. And the for, for the CSI, the uh, permission for the volume is also 777, which makes the volume free for all. And the note on